الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد Honorable Ulama, respected elders and brothers, I take this opportunity in acknowledging the town of Zinyaville in Rustenburg for hosting Muhammad Hublus on this wonderful tour that Radio Islam in conjunction with Qurtuba Academy is hosting, mashallah. I would also like to start off by thanking you for participating in today's program. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it fruitful and beneficial for one and all. We're going to start off tonight's proceedings with a qira'ah which will be rendered by Qari Anas, Anas Mutara. We call him forward to, inshallah, start of the program officially. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين فرقوا دينهم وكانوا تَمِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُ من جاء بالحسنة فله عشر أمثالها ومن جاء و 
وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيْئَةِ فَلَا يُجَزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا فَلَا فوق بعض 
ورفع بعضكم فوق بعض درجات ليبلوكم فيما آتاكم إن ربك سريع وهو الذي جعلكم خلائف الأرض ورفع بعضكم فوق بعض درجات ليبلوكم فيما سريع العقاب وإنه لغفور رحيم صدق الله العظيم Soul stirring kira indeed, mashallah. May Allah accept and carry up and take him from strength to strength. There's a beautiful narration mentioned in Ibn Majah. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Inna min al nasi mafatiha lil khayr, maghaliqa lil sharr. There are certain people in the community whom Allah has used as keys to khayr and goodness. Through their presence, a lot of good gets done in the community. They are a means of a lot of khayr and barakah. They peddle what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to drive. They contribute towards the upliftment of the community. Wherever they can play a supporting role, they are in the front. And they are always trying to move the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forward. Allah says there are those kind of people in the community. And then the hadith goes on to say, وَإِنَّ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَفَاتِيحَ لِلشَّرِّ مَغَالِيقَ لِلْخَيْرِ On the flip side, you get those people who are keys to evil. They peddle the agenda of shaitan, the accursed one. They connive, they gather, they conspire, they break the commands of Allah, not only on their own personal capacity, but they also get others to join in and break in the command of Allah. So there's two groups of people the hadith has discussed. And beautifully, the Prophet of Allah ends off this narration by saying, فَطُوبَ لِمَنْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ مَفَاتِحَ الْخَيْرِ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ Glad tidings be to those people whom Allah uses as a means of khair and barakah, as a means for people changing their lives, as a means of people abandoning the evil and coming onto the straight path. وَوَيْلٌ لِمَنْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ مَفَاتِحَ الشَّرْ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ Destruction be to that person who becomes a means of evil and invites others also to evil and vice. Brothers and sisters in Islam who are listening over the airwaves of Radio Islam International this evening, this is food for thought. Every person needs to reflect here in which category of people am I found? Am I becoming a means of goodness in my community? Are people benefiting uh, positively through my presence? Am I becoming a means of stopping good or am I becoming a means of spreading good? 
Those are the two avenues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discussed in this hadith. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, said to Sayyidina Ali, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النَّعَمِ Oh Ali, if Allah guides through you one person, one person is better than red camels. At that time, in the time of the Arabs, the most precious commodity was a red camel. The Prophet of Allah said, in our terms you would say, it is better to guide a person through you than to own a Ferrari. So brothers, the message that I'm conveying to you today is a very important one. Let us become means of spreading good in this world. Let us not become the means of amplifying evil in a world that's already so wicked. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Under this pretext, we can understand the role that brother Muhammad Hublus is playing, whom Allah has used as a means of many people coming onto the straight path, whom Allah through his mercy and karam and fadl and grace has used for many youngsters to change their lives, whom Allah has used for many khair and barakah to come in many people's life. You and I need to play the very same role in bringing people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this is the duty of every single believer in this world. We'd like to thank you once again for coming out tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the community. We also would like to thank you for hosting the annual ijtima at your grounds. We had a hospitable stay here, mashallah. And we really benefited from the structure that was put up here in Rustenburg. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. We understand the last time Brother Hublus was here, Rustenburg was on the itinerary, but the program did not materialize. Alhamdulillah, it is his second visit to South Africa. And through the fadl and the grace of Allah, this program has come together. We thank you uh, once again from the depth of our heart. We also request you to make dua for Radio Islam, which continues to serve the ummah on great length, mashallah. We've got 60 full-time, uh, we've got a staff complement of 60 with 18 ulama on board that drives the major programs of the radio station. And alhamdulillah, 2017 marked 20 years of broadcast for Radio Islam International. And we continue to grow with your du'as and your efforts. And we ask you to make du'a for the radio station. We call upon Brother Muhammad Hublus to render pieces of advice for the community that has gathered here. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu <coughs> alaikum wa rahmatullah. If I can kindly ask, as your, uh, your humble guest, if I can kindly ask all the brothers to move forward, inshallah. And those brothers that are sitting in the back of the masjid, it would really make me happy if I can see your faces, rather than just see heads and shadows in the background there, please. So if I can kindly ask you all to move forward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless one and all. Inshallah, before we start, uh, I would like to thank, mashallah, all of the ulama and the seniors and the elders and those that are in charge of the masjid for your, uh, for your kind hospitality and extending your hand and opening this place and allowing us to be here. I would like to thank all of those that are involved. Wallahi, I don't even know who is involved, but whoever they are, they know who they are.
for making this possible, for allowing me to be here. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all and your children and your families and this blessed country. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the King, the Master, the Sustainer, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And we send peace and blessing and blessings upon his beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers, before we start, please, something that is very important for yourself and for myself is that whenever we come to a talk, we come to a khutbah, we come to listen, it is very important that we understand we are not here for me entertainment. We are not here simply to see what does the brother have to say. This, my brothers, unfortunately, Dean is going down the entertainment industry road. We are not here for entertainment purposes, my brothers. This is for the youth, for the seniors. We are not here simply because, you know what, I happen to pray Isha, and if I walk out now, it's going to look very bad on my end. So inshallah, let me just sit on the, you know, I'll find a chair or maybe I'll find a corner. Wake me up when it's time to go, inshallah. La Allah, rather we come here with open hearts. We come here with open hearts. Because these were the halaqat when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to sit down with the Sahaba. These were the halaqat that changed the world. So my brothers, we come and we come with an eagerness. We come always with the intention that, Ya Allah, I am the one that is most in need. I am the one that is most in need. My brothers, when it comes to our deen, where do we turn? When it comes to understanding Islam and understanding the Quran and understanding the Ahadith, where do we go? There's a tartib. We first start at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as he was the pinnacle. Then we go from Rasulullah to the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum jami'an. Then from the Sahaba we go to the Tabi'een. Then from the Tabi'een we go to Atba'a at Tabi'een. And this is the structure and this is the system. Deen is not like any other science on earth. Any other science, any other knowledge, anything that comes in this world, as time goes on, it improves. Any scientific research, it improves only with time. Deen is the exact opposite. Deen, as time goes by, more deen is lost. Authenticity is lost. Proper understanding is lost. The closer, the more you can go back, the stronger the knowledge, the better the understanding. So when it comes to our deen, who do we look to? To the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions. These were the people that understood deen the best. Look, my brothers, let me be straight out. Tonight I'm going to mention things that are going to make many people uncomfortable. Number one, let me state, I did not fly 24 hours to come here and insult you in any way, shape or form. Nor did I come here to make you feel uncomfortable in any way, shape or form. But having said that, I have not come here for your entertainment purposes either. You know, many of us, we like this sort of deen where, you know what, you rub my back, I rub your back, you make me feel good, I'll make myself feel good, and we all walk out and we're all fine and dandy. This is not deen, my brothers. The job of the anbiya was never ever to sit there and make people feel comfortable. It was rather to deliver the message to the people. My brothers, the way that you and I are living our lives... Is it what Allah and His Prophet want? Is it? You look at the lives of the Sahaba, you look at the lives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. then you compare that to your life. And you ask yourself, please, for the love of Allah, you know what Umar ibn al-Khattab used to say, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that judge yourself before you are judged. Weigh yourself before you are weighed. Hold yourself accountable before you are held accountable. Ask yourself, reflect, look at your life and then look at the measuring stick that Allah sent. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That is the bar. That is the measuring stick. 
That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Allah wants from each and every one of us, He wants Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the best of your ability. But that's the bar. That's the bar. There's a new word in town, extremism. Do you have that here in this country? You come to the West, Islam equals extremism. It's so severe in the West that even Muslims now, you say the word Islam, what do you think automatically? If not terrorism, you think the other one, extremism. What an injustice to Islam. The two worst, the most potent words have now been attributed to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two words, my brothers, either extremism or what? Terrorism. But when you think Islam, what do you think? What do you think? Even now, wallahi, amongst us, even amongst our circles, we have amongst ourselves, we have a new urf, a new common understanding as what we deem is too much and what we deem is, yeah, this is the norm. But who sets that bar? It's not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we set it. Understand something, my brothers, this is, this is a qaida in your deen, this is a fundamental, this is a pillar in your deen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the measuring stick that Allah sent. Unfortunately, when we look at Rasulullah, we look at him as, as if, and of course, he cannot be compared to any human being. But we look at him as he is this unique individual who has his own, I don't know what the words, but we, we separate out. For example, when we say, brother, look, Rasulullah said, Habibi, but that's Rasulullah sallallahu. Who are we, Sheikh? You know? <laughs> that's Rasulullah. Habibi, that Rasulullah, that you, Allah sent him to be the example for all of humanity from the time of Sahaba until the day of Qiyamah. Allah said, this is the example. In Rasulullah, there is a perfect example. This is what Allah wants. Rasulullah is perfection. And Allah and his Prophet have stated that he is the middle ground. Rasulullah is the middle path. Rasulullah was not extreme in anything he did, in anything he said, in the way that he lived his life. He was the balance that Allah wanted. We need to understand anything more than Rasulullah is extreme. But anything less is also extreme. We never look at the other end of the scale. So I'll give you an example. Sometimes a brother, he has a beard like this. He tells your brother, that's extreme. I say, I'm happy and I'm prepared to accept. As long as you're prepared to tell me that the man that's clean shaven, he's also extreme. Are you with me? Do you understand where I'm going? He was the balance. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is what Allah wanted. It is so sad and unfortunate that you and I think that the Prophet of Allah made decisions that were between him and Allah. No. He does not think, he does not say, he does not act from his own vain desires. Everything he does, everything he chooses, everything he decides is divine revelation from Allah. So when he chose a simple life, how dare we, how shameful of we, that we accuse that no, the Prophet only lived like this because they went through tough times. Look how evil we've become to make myself feel good about the luxurious life that I live. That is nowhere in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Deep down in our hearts, what do we say? That no, 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 no. Rasulullah lived the way he lived because they went through tough times. 
You and I, we don't realize indirectly what we're really saying is that Allah was a bakhil to his prophet. Deep down, really, if you, if you dissect your words, really deep down, what you're saying is Allah was a bakhil to his prophet. And Allah opened barakat on me. No, 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 no. no. He was the balance. He was exactly what Allah wanted. And for the Sahaba, they knew that their success was only by following him step by step. Step by step, they knew, wallahi, they knew that true success is by following him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not an inch more and not an inch less. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, imagine a man who earned the name. Imagine being nicknamed. Anyone know what his nickname was? Majnoon al-Sunnah. Majnoon al-Sunnah, the madman. Who named him this? He was a Sahabi. When people around him called him Majnoon al-Sunnah, who was calling him this? Other Sahaba. <laughs> Other Sahaba were calling him Majnoon al-Sunnah. Why? But he knew like his father knew. He knew like his father knew. When Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Amir, and uh, you know, his rule, the 10 years of Umar ibn al-Khattab became known as the golden years of Islam. The golden ages of Islam. When Umar ibn al-Khattab became the ruler and money started coming in and luxuries now started to coming in, you know, money, wealth was now coming into Medina. Those companions that were struggling for years under the rulership of Rasulullah and under the rulership of, you know, of uh, Abu Bakr, you know, those that were struggling, now under the rulership of Umar ibn al-Khattab, imagine young kids used to walk into Masjid al-Nabawi Masjid the Nabawi, and there would be gold and silver stacked up in the corner. The crowns, the crowns of the kings and the, you know, and the rulers of Persia and Rome, their crowns used to be in the masjid. And the little children, the little kids of the Sahaba used to kick the crowns around, playing with it in Medina, in Masjid the Nabawi. Money started coming in. When the Sahaba seen the money, they used to smile and rejoice. And Umar ibn al-Khattab used to cry. So they used to tell him, Ya Amir al muminin rejoice rather these are good times. Good times have come our way. Look, look, look my brothers, wallahi it is unfortunate. Deep down, let's be honest. Deep, deep, deep down, your measuring stick and my measuring stick is not Rasulullah and his companions. Wallahi it's not. I take an oath by Allah it's not. The Sahaba seen this, they said, Umar ibn, these are good times, rejoice. What did he used to say? He used to say to them, I ask you by Allah, am I more worthy than Rasulullah and Abu Bakr to have this? Answer the question, am I yes or no? Look at the deep understanding, look. Am I more worthy? Today you and I, when money comes our way, Allah, Allah, Allah. My mother made dua for me in Laylatul Qadr. And when Allah withholds money, what happens, my brothers? Be real, be real. Today we measure Allah's love based on money. Tell me what car you drive, I'll tell you how much Allah loves you. Tell me how many bedrooms you have in your house. I tell you where you stand with Allah. Tell me. We measure Allah's love based on dunya. Based on dunya. Today we see big mosques, we smile. Umar ibn al-Khattab. They went to, the, he almost went to war with the Sahaba. He almost went to war with the Sahaba. Because all they wanted was to put some paint on the walls. He wouldn't accept. <laughs> Today when they give me tours, um, and you know, Sheikh, and the chandelier came from Turkey. The chandelier came from Turkey. 
Sheikh, it's, it's, it's fine, please, it's fine. Yeah. The chandelier came from Turkey. MashaAllah, one brother, he donated the carpet. It was hand-woven or hand -woven. We love this world. We love this dunya. We love these materials. Umar ibn al-Khattab almost went to war with the Sahaba. They had to beg the man. Not, not just some paint on the wall. He refused. He says, this is a distraction. This is a fitna. We're not here for this rubbish. <laughs> we measure Allah's love based on how much tabuli Allah gives you, bro. This is, this is, this is. So when money started coming in, understand, look, depth, depth. Wallahi, my brother's depth. When money started rolling in, and the, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab was like, he ruled with an iron fist. The Sahaba were choking, choking. The man doesn't let us do anything. He doesn't let us breathe. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't, you know, enjoy some luxuries. Eh? So one day the Sahaba, they came and they gathered. And they came to his, to his daughter and the other wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look, even the Sahaba, they knew, they knew. They said, look, if any one of us dares speak to Umar ibn Khattab about this stuff, Habibi, he'll chop your head and he won't lose a moment of sleep. So look how they planned and plotted. They said, we'll send his daughter Hafsa, who's the wife of Rasulullah, so he's going to be extremely patient with her. You know what I mean? And we'll send Aisha, the, 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 you know, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and the, again, the wife of Rasul. So, you know, so they sent them to, to Umar ibn al-Khattab, telling him, yani, ya Amir, uh, yani, relax, man, relax. <laughs> Give us something, man. We're, <laughs> we're struggling. Actually, wallahi, they weren't even asking for themselves. They were asking about him. They were telling him, yani, just eat something, bro. Eat something. You're walking around with a thob with, with 14, 16 patches on it. Yani, ya Amir al muminin the, you know, times are not like they used to be with Rasulullah. Things are good. Money is coming. The ummah is growing. Things are prosperous. So they came worried and stressed. Who's going to tell this man? Who's going to speak to Umar ibn al-Khattab and tell him about these things? So they sent the, you know, so they sent the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then when they called him, as soon as he walked in and they opened the topic, he says to them, I ask you by Allah, who pushed you towards this? Who pushed you towards this? He knew, he knew this is the heart of a believer. Anyway, cut a long story short. You know what he says to them? You know what he says to his daughter and what he says to Aisha radiallahu he says to them, I ask you by Allah. I ask you, but you were the closest of people to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Am I doing anything more or less than what he did? They said, no. He said to them, look, my Habib and my companion have left me. Let me do as they did so I can catch them and be with them. Let me do as they, let me be with them. Men of understanding. So the son of this man, Abdullah, the man, imagine nicknamed Majnuna Sunnah. Why? Why? You know, you, know, Wallah, you know what's so shallow of us, my brothers? Some of us, of course, we never say this on our tongues because we always like to act like we love and we respect the Sahab. Habibi, when you love, let me tell you something. You know what it means to love? Who knows? You know what it means to love? To love is to obey. That's love. When you love, you obey. When Michael Jackson used to slick his hair and wear a black leather jacket and do some of the most ridiculous dance moves and thousands of kids used to imitate him all over the world, none of us lost a moment of sleep. We used to look at it and smile and say, so they love the man, you know, subhanAllah. They love the man. True love is to look, to imitate, to act, to walk, to talk, to dress, to think, to live. True love. But we love the theory of Rasulullah, not the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That's the truth. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, he used to walk, imagine, just because I don't want to stress on this point, imagine he was walking one day, he was riding on an animal and he had a companion with him. So they're walking, and then Abdullah ibn Umar, for no reason whatsoever, he ducked. So the Sahabi that was with him, you know, it's like, 
you know, when something's uncalled for. So he says to him, Abdullah, well, <laughs> why did you duck? For sake of understanding, imagine you and I were walking out of the masjid. And then as we're walking, all of a sudden, I jump out of the way. So you look around. He said to me, brother, why? <laughs> why did you jump? So the Sahabi asks him, he says to me, Abdullah, why did you duck? He says, I was with Rasulullah when I was a young boy. I was with him when I was a young boy. And he was riding on his animal when he got to this place. There used to be a tree right here. Where there used to be a branch. So he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he ducked so the branch wouldn't hit his head. He said, I didn't want to be in the same place that Rasulullah was and not do the same action that he did, even though the tree was long gone. The tree was long gone. But they knew, they understood that their Jannah, that their Firdaus, that their success is to follow this man to the last absolute moment of their lives. And I swear by Allah, my brothers, if in your heart you love or you believe that anything other than what he did and what he brought So who understood Deen, my brothers, then? Because I don't have much time. My brothers, I want to draw your attention to something. When you look at your life and you look at their lives, you see a very big gap. Forgive me, my brothers, but I look at my life and I look at the lives of the people around me and I can't help but feel like we're, we're in cruise control. We've accepted that deen is what it is, that the a'mal is the a'mal that we know and that we see, and deep down in our hearts we have accepted that this is deen and this is complete deen. Not only this, but deep down in our hearts we have accepted that what I'm doing is more than enough to get me where I need to be. Because the truth is, my brothers, not a single man in this room today has ever lost sleep over his lack of a'mal with Allah. Deep down, my brothers, in places we never speak about on our tongues. You know, my brothers, we've become master liars, masters. We have become professional actors. But guess what? On the day of resurrection, your tongue will not move an inch. Allah says the limbs on their bodies will speak on that day. Deep down, my brothers, we have accepted the life that we're living. Not only that, we have accepted that deep down in our hearts that I am going to Jannah regardless. Look, the truth is, why are you not the man you should be? Why are you not the person you want to be? Because deep down in your hearts, again in places we don't speak about, we have yaqeen that I'm going to Jannah. And then, to convince myself of this false yaqeen that I have, we've become ulama in the matters. Shaykh, doesn't Allah say in the Quran, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah, 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 Allah. We love movies, my brothers. We love drama. 
We love it. I was in the haram. With all my love, wallahi, and all my adab and my respect to the haram. Have you heard the adhan in the haram? Hayya ala In all Arabic, this word does not exist anyway. But we love the drama. Allah, and tears fall down our faces. Allah, did you hear the adhan? We get caught in the emotion, in the voice, in the singing, in the, in the glitter and the glamour. But deep down, the things that really matter. We're dead. <laughs> we love drama. Doesn't Allah say in the Quran, وَرَحْمَةِ وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Shaykh, why are, you, why are you always so negative? Allah is forgiving. Allah is merciful. Allah, every chapter in the Quran, Allah starts it with, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ Allah is the most compassionate. Allah is the most most. And we love these things. We love these stories. We love this drama. We love these verses. Wallahi, we will take a verse with no understanding of what it's for. Why did Allah send it? As long as it soothes me, as long as it's appealing, as long as I can somehow use it to justify the evil life that I'm living. Wallahi, you will take it and you will run for miles with it. Shaykh, doesn't Allah, doesn't Rasulullah say in the Sahih Hadith, it's a Sahih Hadith, that man qala la ilaha illallah, dakhala al jannah, whoever says la ilaha illallah will enter jannah. Allah, 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 we love it bro. So like I said in the beginning, who understood, who understood deen the best? Who? Did the Sahaba ever, ever, ever dare speak like you and I speak? Explain to me, my brothers. Wallahi, just, just malish. Wallahi, again, I'm not here to insult anyone. Wallahi, I'm not. Why is it that when you look at their lives and you look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu why is it that they were worried and they were stressed and they were concerned and you and I, we are not stressed, we're not worried, and we're not concerned. Why is it that they were doubtful? Why is it that they would always question themselves that would Allah accept me? Yet you and I, deep down in our hearts, deep down, have full yaqeen that I'm going not only to Jannah, but Firdaus al-A'la. You look at our lives, we're in cruise control. Cruise control. No one is stressed. No one is worried. No one is pushing. No, no one is losing sleep. No, 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 no. Hey, relax, Habib. Allah. Wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay, Shaykh. Man, relax, brother. Who understood deen better, me or them? Who understood these ayat of the Qur'an better, me or them? Why is it they were stressed and I'm not stressed? Why is it they were worried, I'm not worried? Why? One of two options. One of two options. Either they misunderstood deen and I understood it correctly. Or they understood and we misunderstood. One or the other, it can't be both. They're worried and stressed and I'm relaxed. They would push, 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 worry, worry, stress, stress, and I'm in cruise control. Either they misunderstood Allah and His Quran and His ayat, and they understood the hadith, they misunderstood the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you and I all of a sudden, we are somehow the blessed, gifted, chosen people, we understood deen correctly. Or it's the other way around. Which one? Don't answer. You answer between you and yourself. 
Your job and my job, my brothers, please understand with depth. My job and your job is not to be like the Muslims around you. The old sati in the masjid, or the old, or the imam, or the, or the current ulama, with all my love and respect for them, they are not the measuring stick. They are not. Rasulullah and his companions, these were the men whom Allah says, Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. Allah was pleased with them. Allah chose them. Allah selected them. These were the men that Allah chose. They understood deen. These were the men whom Allah chose for his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You and I, my brothers, forgive me. Like I said, I know this topic for some people, it's very, you know, brother, what are you talking about? It's, Habibi, look, don't attack me. I'm giving you the evidence. You tell me from the evidence which, what isn't sitting right with you. Why is it they were worried and stressed and we are not worried and stressed? Tell me why. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where do you, what, like, where do you start? R really, where do you start? Isn't it enough, isn't it enough that the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we know that it is prohibited to praise your brother in front of him. We know from the hadith to praise your brother is prohibited in front of his face. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day in the masjid in the sahih hadith he stood up sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he addressed the assembly and he said to the sahaba he said, every single one of you that did me a favor, I paid back that favor in this dunya. Except for Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I physically cannot pay him back. Allah will pay him back on the day of judgment. <laughs> Allah will pay him back. I, I cannot pay him back. When the reconstruction of the masjid took place, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ordered every door of the masjid is to be closed except for the door of Abu Bakr that remains open. When the sahaba came, when the sahabi came asking him, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love the most? He said, my wife Aisha. So he says, no Ya Rasulullah, I mean from the men. He says, okay, then her father Abu Bakr. The only man that had the honor and the privilege of doing hijrah with the Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know what Abu Bakr says? And please, my brothers, wallahi, I beg you, please, open your hearts, open your hearts, because I fear that if we die in the state that we're in right now, we are in a world to hurt. And understand, the Sahaba were not like you and I, my brothers. Sahaba did not add salt and pepper to their conversation. Sahaba didn't know these tricks. Sahaba, whatever was on their hearts and minds, they spoke. Without adding any flavor, any drama, any nothing, nothing. Whatever came to them, they spoke. He says, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know what he says? He says, I wish I was a leaf on a tree. That an animal, look at the description, look at the picture he paints. He says, I wish I was a leaf on a tree that an animal came, bit the leaf, chewed the leaf, swallowed the leaf, digested it, then defecated it on the floor. He says, I wish I was that and not Abu Bakr who has to stand in front of Allah and be held accountable for the life that he lived. 
and you and I were in what? We're in cruise control, man. <laughs> Sheikh, I know, astaghfirullah, <laughs> but you know, you know, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I've done Hajj three times. Allah. My son's a half is Sheikh. Just saying, you know, just saying. You know, my father, he established this masjid, huh? Old Safi of them. He says, I wish I was that. And not Abu Bakr who has to stand in front of Allah and be held accountable. I ask you something. Abu Bakr didn't know that Allah is wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Abu Bakr didn't know this verse. Wallahi, I'm not here to attack. Maybe I've misunderstood. Wallahi, maybe, maybe someone has fooled me. Just explain to me. Abu Bakr didn't know the verse? Tab Abu Bakr didn't know that man qala la ilaha illallah dakhla al-jannah? He did. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe Abu Bakr didn't know. Do you think, do you believe? Is there any room in your mind or in your heart? That maybe Abu Bakr didn't know the verse or the hadith? Of course not. So why did he know, yet he was still worried? And you and I were not worried. Why? Why are you so proud of your hajj? Why are you so proud of the yearly zakat that you give? Why are you so confident with the very little that we do? Yet these men who gave their lives were worried. Men whom the Prophet of Allah promised them Jannah multiple times, multiple times. Rasulullah, pro imagine, Habibi, does the Prophet of Allah need to take an oath? Does Rasulullah need to tell you Wallahi? Does he? Does the, the Prophet of Allah takes an, that Ya Abu Bakr, you will be in Jannah. He says to him, the eight doors of Jannah will be not asking, not can you please. The eight doors of paradise will be begging you Abu Bakr to walk in through them. But just explain to me, why was he worried? And you and I, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> I just came back from one chilla, man. Allah accept. You make dua, Sheikh. <sighs> Wallahi, I burn. I burn with frustration, man. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man whom the Prophet of Allah, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to me, Ya Umar, if there was, there isn't, he says, but if there was to be a prophet after me, Ya Umar, it would have been you. Imagine a man who makes mashwura, mashwura with the prophet. And he gave his opinion. The man makes mashwura with Rasulullah. Allah brings Quran down to confirm the opinion of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Promised Jannah multiple times. One day he was walking in the streets of Medina and he hears the verses of Quran being read from a house. Verses that spoke about the punishment of Allah. Sahaba said for 21 days he was bedridden. We had to visit him in 21 days. Couldn't move from his bed. When Allah says, Fee me in the Quran, who is he talking to? You know what, my brothers? Unfortunately, the whole Quran, from Surah Al Fatiha to Surah Al Nas, the whole Quran, and I swear by Allah, the whole Quran doesn't apply to me at all. Again, again, my brothers, don't, don't, don't listen to this tongue that has been trained to lie for so many years. Actions speak louder than words. 
the whole Quran from Fatiha to Nas doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to my wife, and it doesn't apply to my children. When Allah speaks about the prophets, what are the stories of the prophets for you and I? They're bedtime stories for the kids. And then Nuh, he built an ark. And he put a pair of every animal in Allah. Dad, please, can you finish the story? Uh, maybe tomorrow, inshallah, Sheikh. But the story of Nuh, nothing. Complete disconnection. The story of Ibrahim, complete disconnection. The story of Adam, complete disconnection. Isa, Musa, all the stories of the prophets. When Allah mentions Banu Israel, brother, he's not speaking about us, he's speaking about the Jews. When Allah is speaking about Jahannam, brother, he's not speaking to us, he's speaking about the Kuffar. Every verse in the Quran doesn't apply to you and I. When does the Quran apply to you and I? Jannat, tajri min tahtiha al anhar. Allah, I can't wait, Sheikh. I can't. We live in Disneyland, my brothers. Wallahi, I'm not joking. You might find this funny now, but I swear by Allah, when you stand in front of him on the day of judgment, Wallahi, you will not be laughing at all. So you can find comfort now by looking to your left and looking to your right and thinking, but brother, you know, I'm doing what everyone else is doing. Guess what, Habibi? Him, him, me, we're not the measuring stick. We're not the measuring stick. <coughs> Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was Amir al-Mu'mineen. The golden years of Islam. The golden years of Islam was during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Then one day, imagine Amir al-Mu'mineen leading the Fajr Salah in Masjid al-Nabawi. As he was leading the prayer, one of the munafiqeen, one of the hip... Actually, I think he was even a kafir. He was a complete disbeliever. He comes and he stabs Umar ibn al-Khattab in the back with a dagger he had poisoned for two weeks. Anyway, that's not my story. Umar ibn al-Khattab falls down, falls unconscious. Then when he wakes up, guess what was the first thing he asked? He said, did the people finish their Fajr namaz? They said to him, yes, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, the prayer has been prayed. He says, Alhamdulillah. He said, then who stabbed me? They told him. He says, Alhamdulillah, he's not a Muslim. They give him some milk. It starts coming out of his stomach. The Sahaba realized that once the stomach is punctured, he had hours left. Anyway, he makes a few requests. It's an interesting story. It's not my topic here tonight. But I want to draw you to the last moments. Last moments. He sends his son Abdullah to do some final errands. Do this and cover this and make sure and some debts and some this and some that. Now it's his last moments. Khalas, it's his final breath. He's sitting there laying down. His head is on the lap of his son Abdullah. You know, the man we spoke about before, Majnun sunnah His lap was laying there on his head. Sorry, his head was laying there on his lap. And just as he was breathing his last breaths, he says, my son, take my head off your lap and place it on the floor. He says, why my father? He says, because I'm praying to Allah that maybe if he sees me in this state of humiliation, maybe, just maybe, he might have mercy upon me and forgive my sins. And you and I, we're in what? Cruise control. Sheikh, speak about Jannah. Sheikh, speak about Hur al Ain. Sheikh, speak about how forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Sheikh, speak. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. 
one of the greatest ulama of the Sahaba. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was a companion whom the Prophet of Allah imagined one day in, in the Sahih Hadith. One day the Prophet of Allah, he came to Mu'ad ibn Jabal. He says to him, Ya Mu'ad, by Allah, I love you. Who's telling him he loves him? Not your local sheikh. Not your local sheikh. Not the local imam. Not his grandfather. Habibullah. Rasulullah is standing in front of Mu'ad ibn Jabal. You know, it's enough to say, I love you. Khalas. No, no. He says, Ya Mu'ad, by Allah, I love you. By Allah, I love you. By Allah, Ya Mu'ad, I love you. Three times. Mu'ad lived to old age. When Mu'ad was dying on his deathbed, an old man, one of the greatest ulama of the Sahaba, a man who died with the testification of Rasulullah and his love. On his deathbed, his last words, you know what he said? He looks up into the skies, old man, feeble, weak. He says, Ya Allah, I lived my whole life in fear of you. Today, my brothers, we don't fear Allah anymore. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. When you don't take your deen from the Prophet and his companions, you become extremists. Does the mercy of Allah exist? Yes. Is it there? Yes. Can you deny it? No. But what's the measuring stick? Not my nafs and your nafs. Not my hawa and your hawa. Even Allah's mercy. If you take it away from his, if you take it away from Rasulullah and his companions, even the mercy of Allah will become your own destruction. Deen is not based on nafs. Deen is not based on what you think and what I think. The deen of Allah is based on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ya Allah, I lived my whole life in fear of you. And now, Ya Allah, I'm an old man. And even if I wanted to do anything, Ya Allah, what can I do? I can't even get out of the bed. All my life I feed you, Ya Allah. Now, Ya Allah. Now, Ya Allah, I'm hanging and I'm clinging on to your mercy, Ya Allah, have mercy upon me. All his life in fee, and then at the last moment when he physically can't do anything, Ya Allah, now your Rahmah. You and I, from the day we were born, Ya Allah, Ya Rahmah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahmah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahmah. And where is the fear of Allah? Nowhere. Who understood deen? Me or them? Please, Malas, just help me understand. Who? Me or them? It's okay. You're, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Trust me. <laughs> Who understood deen? Why are you and I in cruise control and they were not? My brothers, Allah is not playing games. Allah is not playing games. Allah did not give you and I the life that we have so we can, mashallah, go to school and have fun and then after school we go to university and then there's a period of jahiliya. You know that period that we all secretly, indirectly, we turn a blind eye to. Well, khalas, Sheikh, yeah, it's the... Sheikh, you got to change with the times, man. You know what I mean? you got to change with the times, you know. 
so, so look at your life. Wallahi, look at our lives. All of my life, all of my youth, all of my efforts, all of my fikr, all of my worry and concern is to my dunya. And I give Allah my rubbish and my scraps. He works 13, 14 hour shifts like a man, like a beast. Sheikh, we have to show this kuffar that we're hardworking Muslims. This is our da'wah. Allahu Akbar. He's a mujahid on the battlefield. Then when he comes into the masjid, Sheikh, bring me a chair. I have a bad back, you know. If the imam does the major sin of taking a few minutes longer than necessary, Sheikh, who does he think he is? Does he think he's in the haram? Yani? Does he think he's in Medina? Does he think he's in Mecca? Doesn't he know that this state is a working state? Doesn't he know that people have work tomorrow? Doesn't he? What? 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 This is why people don't come to the masjid anymore, Sheikh. The imams have lost touch. You give a man a microphone, he doesn't get off. We need to work. But if I was handing out money, Sheikh, take your time, huh? <laughs> We're not going anywhere, Sheikh. Sheikh, you ikram al daif, you take your time, Sheikh. You take your time. Look at your life, my brother. Where have you invested your life? Where? Where? You're proud of the one or two hajjas that you've done. You're boasting about the one or two, three umrahs that you've done in your life. Really? This is what you're confident about? This is what you're so convinced with? This is, this is what you're going to stand in front of Allah with? This is why you're in cruise control? Where are our priorities, my brothers? Where? But you know why we've accepted it? Because I'm doing what you're doing and you're doing what I'm doing. So you be quiet and I be quiet and let's just give salams and smile about the whole issue. Huh? He lives the whole 11 months of the year. 11 months of the year. He's nowhere to be seen. Very little deen. Allahu alam if he's even praying his namaz. No deen, no fikr, no effort. He will exhaust his body, his fikr, his soul. His whole life is for dunya, dunya, nafs, nafs, hawa, hawa, wife, children. But inshallah, in May we're going for Umrah, Sheikh. You keep us in your dua, huh? And of course, you're not saying anything because you're doing Umrah the month after him. And we have the audacity to say that I can't wait to see the Sahaba on the day of judgment. Habibi, do you think the Sahaba want a bar of you or not? Is that what you think, Yani? Wallahi, if I was a Sahabi, if, of course I'm not, if I was a Sahabi and I seen any one of us in Jannah, Wallahi, I would argue with Allah that injustice was done towards me. You know, we, we were in Uhud, not that long ago, we were in Uhud. You know, Hamza was killed in Uhud. The uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was killed in Uhud. Not just killed, mutilated. <laughs> mutilated. And, you know, every time we go to Uhud, we, we share the same stories with the brothers and try to create this mood and create this scene. You know, wallahi, but I always think to myself, Hamza, his nose was chopped off, his ears were chopped off, his stomach was ripped open, his liver was ripped out, hen took a bite from his liver, she chewed it, spat it on the floor. Yeah, I mean, complete destruction. Sahaba said, when the Prophet of Allah seen his uncle Hamza, we never seen him cry like he cried when he seen his uncle Hamza. And we know that the way you die is the way you're resurrected, yes or no? So Hamza definitely will be resurrected with blood still coming out of his wounds. And trust me, trust me, trust me, Allah doesn't need to ask him, Hamza, what did you do for my deen? 
Habibi, look at his face. That's all you have to do is look at it. No nose, no ears, stomach is ripped open, liver was spat on the floor. Really, you don't need to ask. But wallahi, the thought, man, it's just food for thought. You know, I always think, imagine, imagine, for whatever reason, you know how we dream, like you know how you and I, when we watch a movie, we always imagine being the hero. We always imagine winning the girl in the end. We always imagine, you know, driving the car, jumping over the bridge before it explodes. You know, look, we, 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 we love it, yeah? So just imagine, you happen to just bump into him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, on the Day of Judgment. And then he asks, who are you? Who are you? And if you're brave enough to tell him who you are, Wallahi, I always think, if he was to ask me, what did you do for the deen of Allah? What are you going to say, bro? Before he died, sallallahu alayhi, do I have time or, or not? Are you people falling asleep? Yes, no, you're too shy to answer. I'm going to wrap up. Before he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he walks into the baqiyah, to the cemetery that's next to his masjid. And please, wallahi, again, my brothers, listen with your hearts, listen with your hearts. So he walks into the baqiyah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, sometimes before someone dies, especially if you're close to that person, maybe you don't realize it then and there, but after their death, you start reliving the few days before they died, you s and then you pick up on signs, you know, like it's almost like he knew he was leaving, you know? So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he walks into the baqiyah, he used to walk into the baqiyah, this was a weekly thing for him, but he walked into the baqiyah, the sahaba walk in with him, sahih hadith, huh? He makes dua for the dead. And then interestingly, he turns around to the Sahaba and he says, he says, I long to see my brothers. So the Sahaba, you know, they look around and they say, O oh, Prophet of Allah, aren't we your brothers? Aren't we your brothers? So he says to them, no, you are not my brothers, you are my companions. Now let me stop here because I openly confess that I'm a fruit loop. Openly confess a few screws loose here. Sometimes I'll be driving in my car, I speak to the steering wheel. Whenever I hear a hadith like this, it just every ounce of my body just questions, questions, I have questions. That imagine, imagine, again, let's just imagine, yeah? Imagine you're a sahabi standing there on that day. Men who it was common language amongst them. Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. We will happily sacrifice our mothers and our fathers just for your pleasure. One time, it's a weak, it's a weak narration. But one time the Prophet of Allah, he said to a Sahabi, he says to him, bring me the head of your father. So the Sahabi, not a single question. Not why, when, how, are you sure? Is this wahi? Is this your own personal opinion? Nothing. He says to him, bring me the head of your father. So the Sahabi jumps up, withdrew his sword, and ran out of the back of the masjid. The Prophet of Allah says to him, whoa, 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 come back, come back. I was only kidding. I was only testing your iman. Come on, come on. So now for the Sahaba, men who, Habibi, if he made wudu, they collected the water. If he spat, it never reached the floor. So now all of a sudden they're standing there, they're seeing signs from him, signs of departure, signs that was very hard for them to swallow. Now he says, I long to see my brothers. And then they said, aren't we your brothers? He says, no, you're not, you're my companions. If I was a Sahabi on that day, what do you mean I'm not your brother? What do you mean? All this sacrifice I've made, and you're telling me I'm a companion? So they asked, if we're not your brothers, then who are your brothers, Ya Rasulullah? Who? He says, my brothers are those that will come after me. 
They will come after me. They will believe in me, though they've never seen me with their eyes. And one of them would give up his wealth and his family just to lay his eyes on me. I long, I long, I long to see my brothers. If I was a Sahabi on that day, let me ask you, do you, do you prefer to be the companion of the Prophet or his brother? Which one? Can you compare a companion to a brother? So to prove, this is my personal theory, this is not deen, I'm not a alim that's making tafsir, I'm just a jahil feeding my own nafs. To prove my theory that they were just as upset as I would have been, they said, and how will you recognize these brothers of yours? You've never seen them and they've never seen you. How? You know us by name and by face. We fought with you. We walked with you. We talked with you. We ate with you. We, we, we bled with you. We cried with you. How will you recognize them? They've never seen you and you've never seen them. He says, I will recognize them like you recognize your horse. Imagine, look at the analogy he gave. He says, if one of you had a black horse that had a white face and white feet, and you lost this horse amongst a group of pure black horses, would you not be able to distinguish which horse is yours? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, ours is the only one with the white face and the white feet. He said, I will recognize my brothers like you recognize your horse, for the markings of their wudut will be shining like nur on the day of resurrection. So let's come back to Hamza. Now Hamza's holding his stomach and he's bleeding. He's bumping into you. He's asking you, number one, who are you? Then number two, he says, I right, so you must be one of the brothers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, 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 I'm one of the brothers. If, if he was to ask, what have you done for the deen of Allah? What will you say? You and I were in cruise control. Not only in cruise control. Wallahi, not only in cruise control. Not only do you have yaqeen, yaqeen that you're going to Jannah. Allah says in the Quran, but again, the whole Quran doesn't apply to me, yeah? That's Allah speaking about others. Allah says, whoever feels safe from the punishment of Allah, they are the losers. Not some extreme shaykh, Quran. Whoever feels safe, whoever feels protected from the punishment, Allah says they are the losers. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. Do you know Sa'ad bin Mu'adh? Sa'ad bin Mu'adh was Muslim for seven years. From the day he accepted Islam to the day that he died, he was Muslim for seven years only. Yet Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, after seven years of Islam, when he died in the Sahih Hadith, the Prophet of Allah said, rahman He said the throne of Allah shook when Sa'ad bin Mu'adh died, Muslim only for seven years. We've been Muslim all our lives. We've been Muslim all our lives. Muslims are dying, not in the thousands, but in the millions. Never mind the throne of Allah. I challenge the tree outside to shake. Mus'ab bin Umair died at the age of 17 years old. He died in the battle of Uhud. 17 years old. When the Prophet of Allah sent Mus'ab bin Umair, he must have been 14, 14, 15 years of age. 
Rasulullah sent one boy, 15 years of age. He sent him to Medina one year before the migration. He sent him there, Musa bin Umair. In one year, there was not a single house in Medina except it had a Muslim in it. We've been in this country for centuries. We've been in this country for centuries. I met people who said to me their great-grandfather was born here. Look around you. Look at the millions of non-Muslims around you. Not only do we feel like we're going to Jannah, but Sheikh, if I'm not in Jannah, I don't know who will be there, you know. You know, I drive around in the streets of South Africa. And forgive me, Wallahi, my intention is not to be racist. I'm not. I drive around in the streets of South Africa and I see the native man, is it? The black man. And I look at their condition. And I say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiya. What Allah will do with us on the day of resurrection when they stand in front of Allah and speak, man. My time is up. My brothers, wake up. Wake up. Stop living this fantasy. Understand that the measuring stick is Rasulullah and his companions. Allah is not playing games with us, my brothers. Jahannam is very real. And the day of judgment is very real. And Allah is not playing games. Nasallallahu azza wa jalla yaghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'i wal amwat. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu. We say Jazakallah khairan to Brother Muhammad Hublus for those wonderful pieces of advices and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to practice on what has been said. In a nutshell, our objective is to reach Allah and for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as Brother Muhammad Hublus indicated and to measure ourselves for that is the life of Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum and to understand the life of Sahaba, we have an authentic chain coming down from one generation to the another generation. We have transferred the deen from one generation to the other. And this has reached us through authentic sources, through the ulama around us. And so we need to follow in the footsteps of the ulama and also at the same time, um, you know, measure ourselves as to how we are doing. I'll end up with the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مثل العلماء كمثل النجوم يهتدى بها في ظلمات البر والبحر. The example of the ulama are like stars in the sky. Ibn Rajab al-Hambali rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned that the reason why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given the example of stars because of three reasons. Number one in the Quran Allah says, إِنَّا زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِزِينَةٍ الْكَوَاكِبِ we have beautified the earth through the majestic stars. When a person walks out at night and he looks at the stars, he says, beautiful, wow. Likewise, Ibn Rajab al hanbali says, Allah has beautified this earth through the presence of ulama. Number two, min kulli shaytanin marid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the ulama to tackle and combat every fitna that is available in the time. And so you find the shooting star, which they call, or the meteorite, which you say in astronomical terms. That shooting star is actually a star that is chasing a devil who was there for evil purposes on top. Likewise, Ibn Rajab al hanbali says, Allah uses the ulama to combat the challenges and the fitnas of the time. 
the third reason, وَبِالنَّجْمِهُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ Looking at the Qur'an, and through the stars you find guidance. And so, as Brother Muhammad Hublus puts it very importantly, that our objective is Allah, and for that is the life of Rasulullah. And for the life of Rasulullah, we have the Sahaba. And for the Sahaba, we have the Tabi'in and the chain that reaches us. And this duty needs to continue from one generation into the next generation. And so you need to latch on to the leaders and the ulama of the community to find guidance in all affairs of life. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, grant you uh, lots of khair and barakah. And we also uh, thank Brother Muhammad Hublus for sacrificing his time and to be with us today. We'll ask uh, the imam of the locality to conclude with the dua, inshaAllah. اللهم أنت سلام منك السلام تبارك في هذا الجلال والكرام اللهم أعين على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والفعل والنية والهدى إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون سلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين